So, you played Divinity Original Sin 2, realized it was a masterpiece, decided you needed to play Divinity Original Sin 1, got to character creation, and realized it's entirely different. Well, not entirely, but pretty significantly. Well, that's what this video is here to sort out for you. So, welcome to the channel. My name is Mortem. Um, probably the biggest, well, the second biggest, actually, video I've done is my video on character creation for Divinity Original Sin 2. Um, I loved that game so much that I spent like 500-ish hours 100%ing uh, it, even the honor mode achievement, and I really wanted to go back and play the first one, and then I got to character creation, and I was like, wow, this is not as streamlined as the second one. So I figured I'd make a video covering this one as well, uh, and kind of just go over some of the changes for the people who love Divinity Original Sin 2 and decided they wanted to play this one as well. So first things first, you come to character creation screen, obviously. Um, First thing I want to mention is there are two protagonists in this name, uh, in this game. Their two default names are Roderick and Scarlet. If either of them dies, that's fine. But if both of them die, your game is over. Even if you have a party of four, if these two go down, you're done. So that's something to start with right there. As with the video original Sin 2, um, we do have a bunch of preset classes that you can choose from, um, and that's fine if you want to play like classic or story mode perhaps, but for the higher modes it's not going to cut it. So we go in and we click customize. Now this is the same for both parties obviously, so I'm only going to do it on the one. Uh, we click customize again, but it will show you the presets for every preset as far as that goes. Um, so first things first, um, this is the enhanced edition. I can't speak for the original edition. I heard there were some changes um, just to make that clear. Coming on to the ability points. So ability points work significantly different in this game compared to Original Sin 2. So for the most part, the basic concepts are the same. Obviously, uh, weapon skills increase your damage or critical damage with those. So bow increases damage per level. Uh, crossbow gives 10% crit chance, plus your crit strike multiplier uh, gets extra. That's the same for two-handed and crossbow, dual wielding. Um, reduces the damage penalty of dual wielding as well as reducing the action point cost. Uh, Single-handed increases the damage and wand increases the damage. Uh, defense is a little different, especially because most of the defense in Original Sin 2 is handled by your physical and magical armor, um, whereas this is just like straight up percentage chances. So armor, special, uh, armor specialist improves your armor rating as well as decreases your heavy armor movement penalty. Now if you're wearing light armor, obviously you don't need to worry about this, but your guys in heavy armor, your fighters, will absolutely need to have armor specialists to, you know, be able to move. Then we have bodybuilding, which just gives a percent chance to reduce the chance of receiving a status effect on this list, which is knocked down, burning, frozen, bleeding, crippled, blinded, weak, diseased, infected, and drunk. Shield Specialist uh, just gives more chance to block with shields, and Willpower is the same thing as uh, Bodybuilding, just the different kind of effects, so reduces the chance to receive an effect from this list. Skills are a little different, but mostly you'll find that they are the same. However, I do want to mention that instead of this being able to increasing your damage or anything like that, all it lets you do is learn more. So none of these actually really increase your damage, so to speak. It just affects how many action points it takes to use them, because if you don't have a high skill, it'll actually cost you more action points to use a spell. That's a system they scrapped in uh, or, uh, Original Sin 2. So another point is, as you can read from the level one there, it allows you to learn a set amount of skills. Now, even at the maximum, which I believe is five, even then, you cannot learn all the skills. There are more than it is capable to learn. So even if I'm a maxed out expert marksman, I will not be able to learn all of the skills at once. So something to keep in mind. Personality and craftsmanship, uh, nasty deeds, pretty much all the same as Divinity Original Sin 2. Bartering makes things cheaper and better prices. Charisma gives you charming, intimidating reasoning. That one's a little different. Um, instead of it being basically just a roll like it is in Original Sin 2, like you have to play this weird rock, paper, scissors mini game that no one seems to like. Leadership, uh, boost initiative and damage of your party. That's actually the same as Original Sin 2 as well. Um, Lucky Charm increases your chance of finding extra treasure as well as improves your chance to hit. 
Craftsmanship is mostly useless besides lore master and telekinesis, to be honest. Uh, crafting is... I only used it for one thing, and it really wasn't worth the points. Blacksmithing is all but useless because repairing in town is very cheap. Lore master is useful so you don't have to run back to town and constantly identify your own stuff. And then telekinesis lets you move uh, heavy items for a distance. There are actually speed runs that like, basically run off of telekinesis. Then we have lock picking. Lock picking is of course really good at you know, picking locks. Um, this is pretty useful. Uh, obviously you'd want to have at least one person do that. Uh, pickpocketing and sneaking are unnecessary, but if you're role playing, you know it's not a bad way to go. Now, other than what they actually do, I did want to mention that, at least in the enhanced edition, leveling these up works a little differently. So obviously I can put a point in one of these, so say I want her to use bows, I put the one in. Now the catch is, and I didn't realize this until I was an embarrassingly far way into my first playthrough, I couldn't figure it out. Um, so if you take nothing else from this video, let it be this, the next skill costs two ability points. And then after that, it's, you know, one, and it, it increases for everyone. So in order to get to three, I'd have to have three extra ability points. And it took me an embarrassingly long time to catch on to that, so there's that information for you. And then we're moving on to talents. Now I'm not gonna go over every single one of these, just because there's a lot and most of them are incredibly nuanced and not particularly useful. However, you will see a lot of the ones from, you're familiar with from Divinity Original Sin 2, which are uh, Arrow Recovery, Backstabber, Bully, Courageous, Elemental Infinity, all those stuff. Um, Bully is actually pretty cool, by the way, just a quick aside. It actually boosts your physical attacks against opponents that are knocked down by 50%. I actually really like that on fighters because they're knocking people down a lot. But truth be told, uh, if you look at my video that I already have about Divinity 2, uh, Divinity Original Sin 2's, which talents to pick, it is almost identical to this. There's a bunch of little ones that they cut from Divinity Original Sin 2, and you can pretty much tell why just by looking at them. Like, it's not useful like um this one with pinpoint your grenade throws will never miss again why is that a talent why am i missing when i throw like i that's the system they took out of the original sin too it is so if you throw a grenade in this game there's a chance that it will like not go where you threw it so that, like stuff like that they cut out so basically just watch that video from the Divinity original sin 2 and it, it's pretty much the same most of this is useless and the ones they kept in original sin 2 are honestly the best ones so from there, we have attributes. Now, attributes are a bit different in this one as well. Not so much what they actually are, that actually stays pretty much the same. Um, strength is, of course, uh, your man-at-arm skill, which essentially takes the place of warfare um, and increases how much you can carry. Uh, dexterity um, increases your offense rating with dexterity weapons, improves expert marksman, scoundrel, all that stuff. So, mostly this is the same as Divinity Original Sin 2. So obviously, you know, if you're a mage, you want to put points in intelligence. If you're a fighter, you want to put points in strength. If you're like a roguish, you want to do dexterity. Um, speed affects everybody. More important for uh, melee fighters, that kind of stuff, um, as well as your rogues, that kind of thing, because this affects literally how far you can move, your initiative, as well as your action points per turn. And then perception is important for your ranged guys, because in this game, um, bows actually have a percentage chance to miss the farther you are away to like the point where it's possible to be like a 30% hit chance with a bow. There's a skill that increases it by 50% for four turns, which is basically mandatory for expert uh, marksman people, by the way. But that said, the main thing I want to get across to you here is the numbers are significantly lower in this game than two. Like um, in Original Sin 2, towards the end of the game, it's not uncommon to have like 30-ish, even 40-ish points in a stat. In this game, like 15 is a very high number. So keep that in mind. And then of course we have where you can actually pick what skills you have. This is of course based on your actual skill choices. So if I put a point in Arrow Thurge, I will then be able to pick from the starting Arrow Thurge skills. And that's pretty much how that works. In this regard, it's actually very similar. You get uh, a list of starter abilities for each particular kind of skill that you can then pick from. You'll recognize a lot of these from Div Divinity Original Sin 2. However, um, a lot of them are actually different, so it's worth going around through. Now, before I actually wrap up this part, we have our 
Arrow Surge, which is of course your um, lightning spells. Expert Marksman takes the place of Huntsman. It is your bows and things like that. Geomancer. Uh, Geomancer is of course your Geomancer spells. Um, your earth spells, your poison, stuff like that. Hydrosophist is your healing and your ice spells. Man at Arms is, it takes the place of Warfare. Well, Warfare took the place of Man at Arms, I should say, and is your fighter abilities. Pyrokinetic is, of course, your fire spells. Scoundrel is, of course, your thieving spells. Witchcraft is, witchcraft is kind of like, it, it actually rolls kind of several concepts into one. It's a lot of, uh, Scoundrel took some of these, for instance. Here, I'll show you guys kind of some of the stuff I'm talking about. Witchcraft's a bit of a strange one, like, Maldiction, it'll like to set cursed and weakened. Oath of Desecration will give somebody a, uh, a huge damage boost. Um, like Oath of Desecration is actually a damage of target increases by 40%. So it's kind of a very support class, but at the same time it has the vampiric stuff from Necromancy. So basically they combined like Necromancy and some of uh, the summoning skills from Divinity Original Sin 2. Basically what happened is they took Witchcraft and they split it into several uh, more nuanced skills. And then from there, um, so a couple things you'll notice are missing are missing are uh, like things like summoning and necromancer. Now, as I just mentioned, they split up witchcraft a bit as far as necromancy and some of it went into scoundrel and things like that. Um, summoning was actually spread across several of these skills. Like geomancer has summons, witchcraft has summons, um, pyrokinetic has a summon, hydrosophist has a summon. So they basically took all of those summoning skills and they put it in one place. Um, and then they took the elemental part of it and they kind of uh, added the infusions with the summoning skill and Divinity Original Sin 2, which is much easier to understand than this system. But again, this is the first game, so it kind of is what it is as far as that regard. And that is pretty much it. So you do actually have to uh, spend the points. It won't let you not spend them. So that's something to keep in mind, but you know, obviously you would want to do that anyway. And then of course you have your actual uh, appearance customization. It lets you pick a portrait versus actually rendering what your face looks like uh, in the next game. Um, you can pick an AI personality, which are all pretty straightforward. Uh, knight, Rascal, Maniac, um, stuff like that. That's important because you actually gain uh, sk some skills and things based on your uh, conversation options. Um, you know, if you choose to respond a certain way to certain things, it gives you traits, they call them, which can affect stats in small ways. Um, that's not a huge thing. I would say just play the game the way you want to play it, and most of that stuff will work out. They're just nice little bonuses. I wouldn't really say they're integral to much. You can, of course, pick the type of voice you want, skin color, uh, head options, hair, uh, hair color, things like that. Underwear, which is a funny option. I don't know exactly why that one's in here, but it seems to be a joke of some sort that I'm not in on. Um... And then, of course, you can make Scarlet the guy, or vice versa, whatever you want to do there or even have two males, um, but the default ones are Scarlet and Roderick. They don't actually hold you to only having uh, the female and the male. However, the canon choice is that it was Scarlet and Roderick doing this. So, one thing I do want to mention that is a little different. Now, while you can customize the presets, which is totally fine, the main thing you want to keep in mind is that the class you actually pick affects your starting equipment. So you don't start with nothing like you do in Original Sin 2. You start the game with equipment because you're arriving to do a job. So if you're an enchanter, you'll start with robes and a wand. Um, if you're a fighter, you'll start with heavier armor as well as a sword. That is important because of some of the speedrunning things you can uh, look up. Um, they actually they take specific starting equipment from a particular class and they use it to full advantage. So that's just kind of something to keep in mind. So that's pretty much it guys, there you go. There is a look at character creation in Divinity Original Sin 1 and how it works. So if there's anything you guys think is cool, anything you guys want to talk about, um, by all means, let me know. Don't forget to check out my Witch Talents to Pick in Divinity Original Sin 2. It kind of goes over the best talents, which is why I didn't cover them super thoroughly in this particular game, uh, video. So, if you guys liked the video, uh, please stick around. I really love the Divinity series, and honestly, top-down isometrics in general, CRPGs are kind of my thing. So, again, if you liked the video, hope you like and subscribe. But otherwise, have a great day.